things like houses, horseshoe crabs, things like that. So there's some bags that we are the beneficiary of a grant from the Maine Community Foundation for. Actually, I took off my Maine Community Foundation vest, so I have a, don't display my conflict of interest. Um, this program had its genesis way back in the fall when we were talking about what to do with a spring symposium, and it led me down a very long and winding trail. And I have, I'm wearing a name tag from the Citizen Science 2015 conference held in San Jose, California. The program for which is this thick with about, I don't know, 600 presentations or something. I couldn't go to all of them, but I did learn a lot about citizen science, and we'll be talking, that's what we'll be talking about today. What I didn't realize was that Friends of Taunton Bay has been doing citizen science for 25 years now. Uh, we didn't always know what we were doing, but we certainly didn't know we were doing citizen science. So you'll hear more about that later on in the day. We have a nice array of speakers. I'd like to start with talking about what citizen science is, sort of defining it, uh, and giving a little bit of a history of uh, citizen science, which you might be surprised to see goes very, very far back in time. Uh, and then to take a little bit of time to unpack in citizen science, what's in it for the citizens, what's in it for the scientists, take a look at some data and how those data can inform us about things. Here I'm going to uh, jump into my uh, botanical roots and talk about phenology for a little bit. Uh, and then I want to introduce briefly some types of citizen science programs. Uh, there are more out there than perhaps you're aware of. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that everybody's aware of those. And then to highlight some of the programs that I've become aware of that are active here in New England. Uh, and that I hope, uh, you know, to hear more about from some of you as well. So, starting with uh, defining citizen science and giving a brief history of this. Uh, citizen science is, strictly speaking, a form of collaboration wherein the data collected are collected by amateurs. And I'm doing that in quotes because we'll see that... Uh, that that definition has uh, an interesting history here. Um, this brings up a couple of other questions as well as to what constitutes scientific data. I'll give you some examples of some things that have been used as data or, or referred to as data as a result of uh, citizen science efforts. Uh, but clearly I hope to present to you that, that we can think more broadly about data in the long run. And then here again, the difference between what constitutes an expert and an amateur, that's a little bit of a gray line there. If you know amateur enthusiasts uh, who are interested in particular classes of organisms, you find they're really quite expert on those organisms. Uh, so anyway, so a little bit of history uh, on citizen science it goes way back uh, much farther than, than we might think. Um, and part of this is really just a function of uh, semantics. If we think about uh, professional scientists, where scientists as a profession uh, wasn't something that came about until the 19th century. So some of our founding fathers, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, noted scientists in their day weren't technically professional scientists and actually functioned as amateurs in a technical sense of the word. So there have been people collecting scientific data for well over a hundred years. We can see here uh, lighthouse keepers have been collecting bird strike data since 1880. National Weather Service Cooperative Observer Program since 1890, and of course the Christmas bird count very famously has been uh, active since 1900. Uh, and we find that uh, looking in different corners of the world that there's an awful lot of interesting ways that people can collect data. Thinking of uh, uh, Robert Godfrey, that was the uh, namesake for the herbarium down at Florida State University where I did my graduate work, uh, had a colleague the Tall Timbers Research Station at the border between Florida and Georgia uh, realized they were going to put phone lines in way back in the day, put phone lines in through that area and actually lobbied for the phone lines to be put in on the property that he managed because he recognized that there will be some bird fatalities as a result of that structure and wanted to be able to capitalize on that. And as a result, they have some of the widest collections of birds from that part of the country at their natural history collection. 
uh, because they have the foresight to do that sort of thing. So there's been a lot of, of different angles people have taken on citizen science over the years. And I hope to see that there's quite a few more that we can take uh, in the future. There's several different types of programs, this different types of citizen science programs that one can be engaged in. Uh, and I'll mention some of these in a little more detail later. There's a data collection type of programs, uh, and there's a bunch of these that are active now, and, and in a lot of cases, you can collect those data and enter them on your phone and upload them straight to a website. Uh, so these have been categorized as what are called citizen sensor programs. So if you see yourself as somebody who can transmit information from where you're currently standing to a database online somewhere else in the country, you serve as a sensor, a citizen sensor of environmental conditions in the space you're in. So that's one type of uh, citizen science program. There's another one I want to point out, and I'll come back to this one a little bit later, image analysis. Uh, we have evolved remarkable pattern recognition systems, much better than any of the modern computer technologies are even capable of approaching these days. And so we are still a valuable resource for looking for patterns in nature and being able to recognize those in ways that computer programs can. There's a, a relatively new uh, venue for citizen sciences record transcription. There are a lot of natural history records out there that are handwritten and computers still have difficulty parsing handwritten notes. And so if we as citizen scientists can serve as a, a valuable role in taking those data from handwritten records, transcribing them into digital records that can then be analyzed uh, by scientists down the road. And then data analysis. Uh, there's been some really clever work done on this field of citizen science. There's actually video games you can play where you're playing a video game, but you're actually analyzing genetic data in the end. And, uh, and it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty awesome. People have had the foresight to do that. So I'm, I'm hopeful for some of those for the future. So I like to, I have to throw some botany in here. You'll have to apologize. You'll have to excuse me for this one. Uh, it's just, that's my background. And so I just wanted to point out uh, a couple different versions of uh, examples of these different types of citizen science. One is the New England Leaf Out Project, which some of you hopefully are familiar with, at least a little bit anyway. Uh, so this is a project wherein you can take data on when we first see leaves starting to unfurl. This is that time of year from plants in your backyard. If you have ID'd them, you know them to species. Then you can report, I saw red oaks in my backyard starting to leaf out now. That goes into a database. We'll talk about this uh, in just a little bit uh, about the value of those data down the road. Uh, so the New England Leaf Out Project, this is a sort of citizen sensor type of program. These programs, the people who run these programs, have been very mindful of what keeps people engaged in citizen science. And it turns out that asking folks to take data and send it off into a big black box somewhere and never see it again is not engaging. It's not engaging at all. And it turns out that if, if you take those data and you make them available for people to explore, that the returns and the engagement of citizen scientists increases uh, uh, significantly. And so this is an example of a, a clickable map from Project Budburst. Um, it's related to the, that the New England uh, Leaf Out Project is a, is a function of where you can actually click on these reports from citizen scientists or citizen sensors and see what plants were flowering when or leafing out at what period in time. And you can see how your data accumulates and how your data fits in with others. So this is a, an interesting angle to take on that. There's some other very, I think, very interesting citizen science projects. I'd love to have more time to engage in these things because I want to see some of this. Uh, there are a lot of means for scientists to take in data that we really, frankly, just don't have time to sort through. So there's an example here of the California Condor, uh, Condor Watch Project, where they've got remote cameras established where they know California condors uh, nest and where they feed, and they're activated, motion-activated cameras, so they collect some amount of footage, an awful lot actually, and so the, the Citizen Science Project is to go watch the videos of the condors, take notes on their behavior, report that back through the website, and that informs the scientists about, in the example here, lead poisoning, uh, which is something that these animals have to deal with on um, some part. So you get to watch California condors on video for some period of time, take notes and, and have a little bit of fun and learn from it. 
Um, something similar to that uh, is the Seafloor Explorer. Uh, this one is a program where you can, again, based on our pattern recognition abilities, take a look at thousands of images that have been taken of the seafloor. And you can imagine cryptic animals like flounders hiding there in the sand that computers will never pick up on. But you can, if you have a keen eye and you develop, uh, develop your, uh, I call the uh, search image for that, pick up on that animal and report it from that image, uh, then it becomes a game. And a lot of these programs essentially have the ability for you to earn badges and points, and so it becomes a competitive thing. You can get your friends involved. Uh, and so there's a lot of really interesting ways to dig into data. Um, so this is data mining. This is actually fun data mining, I think. Uh, transcriptions, of course, this is a, a really big one, taking notes from nature. Uh, and you can see here a bunch of tags. So these are, again, handwritten notes from natural history collections that uh, would be most useful if they were digitized. And again, the OCR programs that computers run cannot still, to this day, parse out handwriting very well. That, you know, my handwriting is anything like it, then I understand why it's not particularly the best. Uh, but we can read each other's handwriting for the most part. So uh, this is a wonderful program. And again, this one has a, uh, a hook of having badges and points that you can earn while you're going along, transcribing these notes. And you'll be reading through the field notebooks of some very noted scientists, uh, which, is, which is pretty interesting. So you get a, a window into that history there as well. Um, their big push here is to improve our world, to take these data of natural history collections, transcribing them into digital form, allows scientists to look back over time at how things have changed. And I'll use phenology as an example of that in just a little bit. Again, you can earn badges, uh, collect badges along the way, and share those with your friends. Uh, and that is contributing to science. Uh, it makes a big difference, right? So we're, we're able to actually and I'll make the argument in a little bit, is a collective human enterprise that we should all be engaged in on some level. So this is making it a very real thing for people. Uh, there's some citizen science uh, projects I mentioned um, that are like games. I want to talk about Fold It a little bit more later. This one has uh, an illustrious history and has some very notable accomplishments. It's literally a game where people will fold a string of amino acids uh, into a protein structure, and the best protein structure wins. Uh, and again, I'll return to this one in a little bit, but it's proved to be a very valuable resource for uh, molecular biology and genetics work. Another element, and this is one that's more recent uh, and, and rather unexpected, but people have realized that, you know, when you're out side and you see something cool and you take a picture of it, quite often your phone takes GPS data on that picture and that metadata is uploaded to Flickr or these other websites when you upload your pictures and say, hey, check out what I saw. Those data can be mined by scientists to produce what you can see here, snapshots. So this is a map of snapshots of uh, taken from Flickr uh, with a search terms monarch butterflies, butterfly there. Um, and it shows you uh, where butterflies, where monarchs have been spotted in the continental US. Uh, and they were able to use these data to produce a uh, description of the flyways that these animals follow uh, from their roosting grounds in Mexico uh, all the way up here. This is just people taking pictures and somebody going into these uh, resources and pulling those data out with the images and using the GPS data that are located with them to produce actual data. So just taking pictures is a good way to engage in citizen science, it turns out. So what I'd like to do is take a little bit, and I don't want to dwell on the ins and outs of this one too much, because there's many other things that we really should spend some time talking about today. But I want to give you an example of how citizen science can actually help us uh, help both the scientists, the citizens, and us humans and the world around us uh, in the long run. And so what I'd like to do as an example for that is um, talk about phenology. And I'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, but first, one thing that's worth thinking about is that citizen science data can represent very broad temporal and geographic ranges. As a scientist, I can only sample so many spots at one given time, in a given season. But if 
there are an army of people, a whole array of citizen scientists out there, collecting data through photographs, through notes, uh, and contributing those data to a database that I can use for research, then I'll be able to get at data that cover the entire US or the world, as it turns out. So very broad geographic ranges. And that's, again, logistically and, and monetarily very difficult for researchers to do. So there's a, an estimate here that citizen science efforts to estimate bird and butterfly abundances save the French government a considerable amount of money. This is something their government uh, estimated uh, in order to uh, support and promote citizen science's uh, viable uh, programs for their, for their country. So 900000 to $6 million uh, worth of research uh, funds that would have been used to that end in the long run. So it's got some definite benefits. Um, one thing that comes up when you go into the citizen science literature beyond the first couple of papers you find, uh, there's some concern on the part of some scientists, although this is beginning to wane, that data collected by citizen scientists is not as robust as data collected by experts. Uh, but in fact, it turns out that's not the case at all. And there's, uh, I think, all total I've seen probably four or five papers to this effect, where people have looked at data accumulated by citizen scientists over time. Um, and it turns out there's two aspects of this that are a benefit. Uh, one is, because of the broad geographic range that citizen science data is drawn from, it's more robust to extrapolation across broad geographic ranges. The data come from a broad geographic range, you can use them to infer things about broad geographic ranges. And the other aspect of it, and this one didn't surprise me, but I hadn't thought about it initially, was the fact that amateurs tend to be very careful when they're taking data because we tend to think, well, gee, I'm not entirely sure. Let me look at the picture again. Yep, that's the species it is, right? So we take the time to do that, whereas experts in the field might on the off chance, take a glance at something and go, oh, such and such, it's the first name that comes to mind. Might be wrong, it's possible, right? We can all, we're all fallible to some degree, but amateurs are very careful uh, when engaging in this, it turns out. So the data are reliable, which is really, really pleasing. So citizen science is, is very viable, and in fact, it's been used increasingly more and more in scientific papers. Uh, so this goes up to 2012, and that was published partway through the year, you can see the bars cut off part of the way up there. Um, but an increasing trend in papers published as a result of citizen science efforts. So this isn't just doing science that, again, is going into a black box somewhere. It's coming out the other end in, in the term of peer review publications. Um, so there's some real, uh, real value to this. The Data that are derived from citizen science efforts can be used for a number of different things, and, uh, and some of these in general tend to be exploring trends in species distributions. One that I know y'all are interested in particularly is determining water quality across watersheds. There's a lot of very interesting programs involved with that these days. And describing trends in population interactions. Um, so this is getting at some of those taking notes on behavior of organisms in their, uh, their home territories. So there's a lot of valuable information that we can take from this. There's a philosophical consideration I wanted to throw out there because, I'm sorry, I'm a sucker for philosophy. It's just one of those things I find terrifically interesting. Uh, we think about science as being largely hypothesis driven uh, and coming from a research one institution like Florida State University. This is one that I bucked against a fair bit during my graduate work. Uh, that I have that you design your experiments and your research program based around a hypothesis that's meant to answer a larger theoretical question. Uh, and so if you are, like I was, interested in natural history research and taking data on something that's not been looked at before uh, and seeing what questions you can answer with those data, it's sort of like flipping the, the problem upside down. And it's not always been very well received uh, in all corners of the scientific enterprise. Uh, but increasingly, scientific work has been data-driven and not hypothesis-driven. And here I'm thinking about genomics work. We've been able to uh, sequence genomes much more easily these days. And uh, there's nothing hypothesis-driven about that. That's data collection that's then used to inform our, uh, our decision-making 
and to formulate hypotheses that can be explored further down the road. Uh, so the point here, I guess, is that citizen science, the sort of work that we can do in citizen science, fits squarely in the philosophical paradigm that science operates under these days. Uh, so this is, a, uh, this is a nice coming together of, of several things. So, uh, like I said, I wanted to just take a couple minutes to talk about phenology and the, uh, the results of some citizen science data uh, that describe phenology and changes in global climate, uh, which has been very much in the news here lately. So, phenology, I should uh, define as, it's describing the life stages of organisms. I think of phenology, I think about when leaves first appear on trees, when flowers appear on trees, when they produce fruits. Uh, these are phenological landmarks in the life cycle of flowering plants, which is my primary region of interest. But you can think about any life stages of any organisms uh, are amenable to this sort of research. The thing that I think makes phenology a really enticing uh, subject for citizen science work is you don't need any particular special data or equipment to do this sort of work. You can notice when something's got leaves on it. You can notice when something's in flower. That's relatively straightforward, right? Uh, so it's, it's fairly easy to train people to do this kind of work. I just grabbed this example of some image that I found online. The phenophases of apple or malice species where key events include when leaves first appear on plants, when flowers first appear, when plants go into fruit, uh, and then when the leaves have fallen off of plants. And these, of course, are all dictated by changes in our environment, changes in temperature, changes in light cycles. Uh, and so recording the timing of these events gives us ideas, uh, data to describe how changes in our environment are changing the life cycles of these organisms. Uh, and I'll we'll make a point just a little bit how important that actually is. Phenology is something that's been studied for centuries in China and Japan since the 9th century, and, uh, and not in Europe until the 1700s. Um, until the 17th century, Carl Linnaeus was uh, the, uh, the founder of modern taxonomy, is the one who, who brought that forth, of course. Um, so officially, phenology has been studied for quite a long time. But, and this one really throws me, there's, relative, there's a number of old sayings that relate to changes in the seasons uh, that, that have to do with phenology and noticing changes in organisms, their behavior and whatnot, uh, that indicate that the uh, phenology's may, studies of phenology may predate written records, and it makes perfect sense. Since we've been in an agricultural society, we have to know when things are going to be available for us to harvest. So it, it makes perfect sense. I think it's... It's, uh, it's reading through this again last night, and I was going, because these are not ones that ring for me, right? It's, oh, yes, I remember that old saying. <laughs> these are indeed really old, antiquated sayings that, that come up. Uh, and it does, it kind of made me wonder, something I'd like to bring up and been talking about a little bit this morning anyway, uh, increasingly getting young people involved in natural history research and interested in natural history is difficult. Um, people are too busy doing this on their phones most of the time. So it makes me wonder, this, this really sparked my uh, wondering about, um, you know, we don't, I don't know how many of these we've got rolling around these days, how much we have in the way of our current social lingo or other uh, aspects of our social uh, interactions that relate to our natural environment. It just kind of makes me wonder about that. I mean, do we really think about that much beyond checking the weather to see whether it's going to be go out good for going out for a hike the next day? Uh, but at any rate, we've been keenly tied into our natural world for a long time, and uh, and just like to try and start instigating that continue as much as we can. Um, we've been able to use phenology, I said, to examine the effects of global climate change, and there's two alarming trends that come out of this. The timing of phenophases for many species are changing, uh, have been changing for quite some time, uh, and that some species ranges are shifting to higher latitudes and higher altitudes over time too. And so we're starting to see this, uh, especially these high latitudes coming from North Florida. It's almost kind of humorous to me, at least because everything grows there. Uh, but up here we're beginning to see organisms appear in, in New England that hadn't been here. Uh, in our recorded history. 
uh, and some of these have become invasive species. And it is, to some degree, uh, arguably a function of changes to our global climate uh, that's becoming more hospitable for them farther north than it has been in the past. So these are some of the reasons why these things uh, are important to think about. And then if you think about the effects of these changes on community structures, so a forest uh, community being the trees, uh, the undergrowth, and all of the fauna that live in that, uh, that forest there, uh, as one element of that community changes its timing of its life cycle, uh, that has effects on everything else that interacts with it. Um, so it's nothing that we can neglect because we're not particularly interested in birds, for example. Uh, an example coming from citizen sciences uh, from the Netherlands, the pie-eyed flycatchers in decline, uh, show the research collected by citizen scientists shows that it's due to earlier leaf emergence, which leads to acceleration of the life cycle of the caterpillars that they live on, and thus those caterpillars are not available for their chicks when their chicks hatch because the timing of their phenophases are out of sync with one another. Um, the research that's been done in this shows that leaf out's been occurring six days earlier than 30 years ago, and we'll see this trend pop up from several different citizen science projects that alarmingly uh, phenophases for, for plants uh, are changing uh, significantly. This is one that, that really piques my interest is that the life cycles of flowering plants and their pollinators have got to be in sync with each other. The plants rely on those pollinators to ensure reproductive success. And those pollinators quite often rely on the goods uh, obtained from those plants, nectar and pollen in some cases, to maintain their own lives. And so when flowers are not flowering, when they're insect pollinators around, has tremendous consequences. And I'm sure we've all heard about uh, the impact that the bees um, in our country have been facing over time for several different reasons. And so we're hopefully keenly aware of the fact that bees are a very important part of our lives. Um, Research in the UK, based on citizen science work, shows that some plants are, in general, flowering up to a month earlier than they were 50 years ago. That's a big jump in time. Um, and so these are, these are not little changes that have been happening. But it requires this long time temporal approach to be able to acquire the data that are necessary to describe this. So here's uh, mean temperatures in February and March uh, recorded at Blue Hill Meteorological Observatory in Massachusetts, uh, where the line here in the middle shows the mean value for all of those data points across uh, the graph. And you can see increasingly, measured from 1880 to 2000, an increase in, in uh, temperatures in that region. Um, and there's been a lot of work uh, done uh, here in New England, it turns out, uh, historically by uh, folks that were all very keenly fond of, I guess, Thoreau. Right, did a lot of work, uh, and a lot of his records have been able to be used to describe changes in phenological patterns of organisms, because he wrote down a lot of information there. So tied with these kind of data, we can get an idea of, of what's driving some of these changes. Um, more conventional types of research looking at uh, pictures of flowers uh, and, and plants in flower from the Arnold Arboretum, uh, and then voucher specimens uh, that are located in the herbarium there show that, and this what this uh, graph represents here is a difference between flowering time from images in 1880 and flowering time in 2000, taken from specimens in the herbarium and taken from photographs, where differences, values that are below zero, show that flowering times earlier, uh, closer to our our time in this graph, uh, shows this downward trend where flowering time has indeed occurred earlier uh, over the past 100 year period here. Um, so multiple lines of evidence pointing to the same sort of thing. Changes in our global climate are occurring and those changes are reflected in differences in the phenophases of the plants that we rely on and that other animals rely on for their well-being. Uh, and it's, it's been pretty interesting to go through some of this and see uh, how some of these uh, data have been acquired. Of course, I mentioned Thoreau. Um, based on those photographs and herbarium specimens uh, and records of naturalists, so again, that transcribing records is very, very valuable. 
has been occurring, uh, flowering has been occurring 3.9 days earlier for each increase, uh, each one degree Celsius increase in, in uh, global climate temperature in a given area. So we've now been able to arrive at some metrics that we can use to predict changes in the future uh, in as much as we're able to predict what global temperatures are going to be further down the road, which of course is, is a difficult thing. Um, but phenological changes have been recorded on every continent on Earth and in the oceans as well. So this is not an isolated incident. Uh, we can see this happening everywhere. Uh, the thing that's particularly vexing is that these shifts in phenology are not occurring at equal rates even among closely related organisms. So our ability to predict what's going to happen down the road is, is complicated. Uh, and more data are needed for us to be able to begin to sort some of these things out. So keep doing the citizen science, I guess is the message that comes from that there. Um, there are a number of factors that play into this, and what I want to do is just take a couple of minutes to introduce a little bit of the biology of this, uh, but then to talk a little bit about the sort of more economic impacts of changes in phenology for organisms. So the timing of leaf out or bud burst here uh, is important. Plants don't want to produce leaves before we're done with the frost. Right? Because you put all that effort and energy into producing these photosynthetic organs to make your living and frost kills them off, you just wasted that energy. So the timing of bud burst is very, very important for plants uh, in their life cycle. It's controlled genetically. It reacts to chilling time, thermal time, and photo period. Uh, and it's a very complex biochemical uh, uh, interaction and it's, it's a terrifically awesome story, but I'm not going to jump into that one for you right now. Um, suffice it to say that some longer-lived tree species are a little bit more picky with regard to these cues. Uh, and so, the, again, as I mentioned before, the timing of these changes are not the same even amongst closely related organisms. So figuring out what works for maples doesn't necessarily tell us what's going to work for oaks in forest. So we need to keep those kinds of things in mind there. Um, they affect the production of trees that are raised for pulp. Right? So if we think about the fact that trees produce leaves, leaves conduct photosynthesis, and the photosynthetic products are used to feed those trees to provide them with the ability to grow, if their phenology is out of whack with the, with the seasons and they lose leaves to frost damage um, and wind up with reduced productivity of those plants, uh, and so that has an impact, an economic impact on that industry. Likewise, the same sort of thing for those plants, uh, those trees in particular that we, uh, that we get crops from, right? So uh, fruits that we value, uh, nuts and the like, cherries, apples. Uh, their ability to produce big, beautiful, ripe red apples is a function of their ability to take in sunlight and, uh, and, and channel that energy into the production of those fruits. Uh, so beyond its really a shame that plants and their pollinators can't get along, we could feel the impacts of this on some visceral level and it might make it easier for us to make a case to folks who aren't naturally drawn into natural history uh, that it's very important that we keep an eye on this kind of thing. Um, we've talked about, I mentioned already that some of the data gathered through citizen science efforts can be used to examine geographic distributions of species. Uh, I'll show you in just a little bit. There's some really, really nice little apps you can get for your phone if you use a smartphone that allow you to record when and where you see invasive species in your area, and those data are uploaded immediately to databases that allow researchers to track the movement of invasive species across uh, a region. And that is the linchpin for citizen science as part of this is that the, the data use for that sort of research needs to be broad in geographic scope. And using citizen scientists to generate this data, as I pointed out already, ensures that to some degree, in as much as you have a broad audience. So there's some real value in that. Um, and then the other point that I'd like to make is that to do some citizen science, you have to learn a little bit, at least a little bit, some of them anyway. You have to learn a little bit of science, a little bit of natural history. So this is a great venue for informal education we were talking about earlier this morning. Informal education uh, for two groups in particular I'm thinking about. Um, one, getting young people engaged in science. So I'm teaching a course right now 
where we're developing uh, interpretive signs for a Middle River Park owned by the Downey's Coastal Conservancy in Machias. Uh, and it's been really wonderful to watch my students think about, well, if we made a sign like this, we might actually get the kids involved, right? We're trying to think of how to get communities, the families and their children, involved in that park and involved in the nature in that park. Uh, and citizen science is one of those ways that we've considered maybe using as a hook to get students, uh, to get young people involved. Citizen science projects can also uh, provide non-formal continuing education for the not so young who don't want to go back to school. I No, I don't want to go pursue any other degrees. I'm done with that. I'm very happy to teach at this point, but I love to learn and to engage in something that helps me to learn more without any undue pressure is a win-win. Right? Everybody gets something out of that. Um, so there's a lot of educational opportunities that come out of citizen science. Um, one of the sad facts that I stumbled across in reading about this in, in regards to science literacy is that uh, recent estimates, and this is from a 2012 paper, recent estimates are that three out of four uh, citizens in this country are scientifically illiterate on some level. Uh, and that's sad. Uh, that's something that could be fixed. Right? And citizen science can be used to promote science literacy, which is what really piques my interest in it. Um, it's also estimated by 2050 about 75% of the world's population is going to live in urban or suburban areas, right? more or less disconnected from nature. But there have been efforts to help get, engage people in thinking about the ecology of urban areas. And in fact, just down the road at uh, Eagle Hill, they just started uh, producing the Urban Ecology Journal, uh, which I'm anxious to dip into over the summer and see what sort of work's being published in there. Uh, there's also a lot of programs that have been done. I'm thinking about the Flyway, I think it is in New York, an old uh, above ground railroad that's been transformed into a public garden that folks can use. So there's a lot of room for those kinds of uh, efforts. Um, I was talking about science literacy. I just wanted to mention a couple aspects of this. As we're thinking about citizen science projects, there's different aspects of science literacy that one could focus on. One of them is practical science literacy, and I've got this labeled as survival science. This is the sort of science literacy that involves don't play with fire, right? <laughs> Gas and flame don't mix particularly well. The sort of practical science that we all grow up with that can take precedence over other types of literacy just for our own survival. But beyond that, we've got cultural science literacy that can be promoted by citizen science efforts that's generating a sense of appreciation for the process of science and what we gain from science as a society, uh, something that I'd say we're probably lacking in. Um, and then civic science literacy, this is the, uh, I mentioned already a little bit this morning, that this is my motivation for teaching non-majors courses. Um, these are people who will probably never take another science course, and I want them to be an informed voting public. I want them to know when something comes up uh, for vote that has a scientific component to it. I want them to be able to parse it, to understand it, and to make their own informed uh, vote on it. So that's one I'd argue is a very, very important component of science literacy that citizen science can engage in. In the end, science is for all of us. It's not for me and my job. It's not for the people who want to have something to do with their time, but rather it's a collective human enterprise, and it belongs to all of us, and it should be shared amongst all of us. And we do that to our very best of our ability. The more this is a dialogue between scientists and non-scientists, I think the more we're all going to benefit from this in the long run. So I like to throw this one out there as a reminder. We don't you know, uh, we don't inherit the earth from our ancestors, we borrow it from our kids, and we really do, and it just, oh, it gets me every time thinking about it. It's, it's important, it's important for us to keep an eye on that, but talking to the, preaching to the choir on that one. <laughs> so I just got a couple more things I wanted to, to toss out there to you, and again, here's coming from a new guy. Uh, I'd like to point out some things that I've learned about citizen science in New England. I'm anxious to hear what you have to say and what you're involved in. Uh, and I'm anxious to be a part of, of uh, new efforts and continuing efforts. Uh, so I see myself as having a place as part of the University of Maine at Machias to facilitate some of these things uh, in as much as I'm capable of. So please let me know what you, what you want, what you need. Um, I'm happy to help. Um, first I want to talk a little bit about types of citizen science programs. 
Um, and I've sort of broken this up in natural history in the summer, image analysis in the winter, and games all year round, because we have seasonal elements up here that I'm not used to. Um, and so I just thought it might be an interesting way to take a look at that. Um, we talked about some of these natural history projects, including the New England Leaf Out Project, and of course the growing seasons here in Maine are whew, terrifically short. Uh, <laughs> but spring, I remember I was like walking across campus and I was like, oh look, at those are all in flower. All right, as soon as semester's over, i got to get back out here and collect. And as soon as it was done, I was out there and I'm like, where'd it go? <laughs> Come on, oh my goodness. So I'm, I'm keenly on top of that one this semester. I've got some exams written ahead of time. I'm going to get out and get some things done. Uh, so we do have a short window of time for doing this sort of natural history work. It's worth capitalizing on that. I've never appreciated summer so much in my whole life. <laughs> I've grown up in Southern California. I moved to North Florida and then phew, all the way up to here. So I've only ever known the summers all year long. I remember being seven years old in California and my dad was asking me about the seasons, right? And I honestly couldn't tell him what order they came in because it's 72 degrees all year long. What do you mean? There's winter? What's winter? Oh, that's when we get rain and Christmas comes, right? That's when that happens. So, um, during the winter months, there's still citizen science that can be done from the warmth and comfort of your own home. If you've got a computer in the house and you can dig into some of these projects, uh, and again, these ones I mentioned uh, rely on our really exceptional pattern recognition capabilities uh, that far outstrip any, any computer generated capabilities at this point. So I wanted to provide you this exercise. Anybody notice any interesting patterns in this image here? Mm -hmm. Seeing it? Anybody not see it yet? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was from here to Frank. And I was on a hike with a bunch of students, a field botany class. We didn't get to go to this property during the semester. And so after the semester, they organized a hike and asked me to come along. And of course, this is the one semester that my major professor was gone for the two hikes we went on where we came across venomous reptiles. But it, literally from here to Frank, and I'm like, where is it? And they're like, it's right there. Where is it? Look for the broken line. Oh, my goodness. It's right there. So Copperhead hanging out here in the leaves. But this is the kind of thing, we see that, like that. But computers won't pick up on cryptic animals very well. So more than we're good at this, we need people to look at these images, to pick out these organisms, because we're the ones who can do that. The computers can't do this at that point, at this point. So kind of cool. It's nice. Feel, feel proud of that. We're, we're good at that kind of thing. Um, Games, computer games I mentioned, if anybody's into playing games or you know kids who are into playing games, get them involved in some of this stuff. Fold It is the one I mentioned already, um, where people try and fold proteins and they've had two really outstanding accomplishments come out of this program. One was, um, let's start over here, the crystal structure of a retroviral protein um, involved in, in, in AIDS that was solved by gamers using Foldit. It says in, in 13 days in the article, 10 days actually, they had the solution in 10 days. It was up for, uh, for uh, no, 10 weeks, sorry, sorry. It was up for 13 weeks, they solved it in 10 weeks. It had been a puzzle for researchers for 15 years up to that point. And they had said, well, let's release it to the gaming community and see what they can do. 10 weeks, man, bomb, they were done. And they had it sorted, and it's confirmed by x-ray crystallography, so we know that they got it right. So, and then, later on, the same program allowed gamers to redesign a protein, a protein that's used in uh, uh, synthetic chemistry. They were able to actually redesign the protein by adding, I think it's something on the order of 13 amino acids to the protein, and refolding it and making it more efficient. And now, of course, they can make the protein in the lab, in that formation and use it and it's producing more product more quickly. And this is all just people who like to, like to play games and do puzzles. So that's an interesting stuff there. There's, a, there's increasingly development of mobile apps. I've mentioned a couple of these. Uh, this is one, uh, Bugwood apps has a couple of these that are used to track invasive species. This is developed around the Great Lakes, but we've got um, folks working on a similar project uh, up here in New England. Um, so this is a great way for people to be able to contribute data to citizen science projects. 
without having to run home, jump on the computer and write things down, keep a notebook around. Most folks have a phone. You can type things into the phone and send those data straight along. This one cracks me up, and I'm ashamed to say I have it on my phone. I haven't played it very much. Uh, the figure busy like crazy. But this is called Play to Cure, and it's essentially a game where you pretend you're in a spaceship and there's a bunch of dots out there and you're flying through these dots and you try and capture as many as you possibly can. Somehow the people who put this together have written an algorithm in which your capturing of those dots is actually functionally analyzing genetic data related to cancer research. <laughs> I, and I, I haven't dug into the ins and outs of the program enough to really understand it, not that I'm sure I could. Uh, but all things considered, as you get done with the run, it tells you how many, how many uh, strings of data you've actually analyzed. So you can compound these over time. So you don't make any bones about it. You're analyzing data. How many data have you analyzed in this particular run? So there's some very interesting things that, that have been able to be done with this. Um, just to give you sort of an overview, of one way of looking at citizen science on a scale from mostly standardized citizen science projects to mostly opportunistic or directed citizen science projects, where citizen science was traditionally paper-based volunteer data collection. My dad's doing one of these right now. He's, he's a go-getter, he's a, entire, a retired person. He's noticed differences in tree bark patterns for different species, differences in the tree bark around branching points in the trees, and he's curious to know how well that holds up uh, for a given uh, taxonomic unit over space. So he's put together a paper-based uh, data collection sheet, and he's mailed out to the Chamber of Commerce in, I want to say it's like 30 states, uh, asking for volunteers to take these data, and he's codified everything, and he wants to know. He's just curious about this question, he wants to know that. Uh, but there are a lot of traditional uh, uh, paper-based um, paper volunteer data collection. Those have largely switched over to online submission. This makes these things more accessible for folks. And then once this happened, it was a short step to incorporating them into social networking sites and providing, again, a submission through mobile devices for folks to be able to take data and submit them on their phones right there in the, in the site. And then the interaction amongst these has been extremely fruitful. The data collected at social networking sites have been available for data mining. Uh, so I showed you a picture of, of that, uh, pictures of monarch butterflies from Flickr that shows their migration trails. We have similar things for, uh, I think whale sharks is another one, where you can identify individuals by patterns on their bodies, and people take images of these things and they upload them to data sites so you can track an individual's movement around the world if people are taking pictures of that individual. Um, some of these uh, that require active participation function through social networking sites. Um, and then through this mobile submission, this allows for citizen sensing in an active framework, sort of real-time citizen sensor data collection, um, which is really exciting. So I mean, you're getting data on the fly from people as time goes by. So things have been uh, particularly particularly fruitful lately. Um, one thing I did want to point out, and this is just for anybody who's thinking about engaging in citizen science work, uh, there's a couple of notes if you want to boil down how to be a good citizen scientist into a couple of points. These would be the three, in my estimation. Um, paying particularly close attention to protocols and guidelines of any projects. Most of them allow you uh, to train or provide some sort of training in the field that you're going to engage in uh, to get you up to speed with the species that you're looking at or features you should be looking for. Uh, and taking good notes. Anything. Anything is noteworthy. And in fact, to that point, note when you don't see something, because null data are valuable. We don't see these birds in our neighborhood. We're actually having this conversation with uh, Gail Krauss on campus about mammals found in Middle River Park as we're building these signs. And she goes, I haven't seen the bats here in the last year or two, that's noteworthy, right? So when you don't see something, is worth noting. Um, and a lot of these sites allow you to explore the data that you're uploading. I showed you a picture of the clickable map from Project Budburst. Um, take some time and check it out. You know, maybe you'll find a spot where nobody's collecting data from, and that's where you go for a hike next Saturday, right? Uh, take some data from there. And then, of course, I'll always, I'll always try to encourage people to be an advocate for biodiversity. 
That's very, very important. Um, we all benefit from that. So, just to point out a couple of programs that are going on in New England, I, I found the Stewardship Network uh, online and perused that here recently. Uh, they've got a nice little catalog. So this is a, a, a sponsored by the UNH, UNH Cooperative Extension, uh, which is, if I understand correctly, is funded by an EPSCOR grant to Maine and New Hampshire. Uh, and so this uh, provides, this network provides uh, contacts and information for 39 citizen science programs across New England. There are a ton of them. And you can sort by organism type, by how much commitment it requires from you, by which state it's in. Um, and every single one of those has a, a valuable amount of information and then a link to the project's website where you can get involved. They also have, and I would note this one in particular, as we're thinking about getting citizen science in a more formal way off the ground, they have the ability for you to submit projects there. So this provides a broader audience for people to engage. Uh, if you have a citizen science project, you can do it that way. So I've just done a little tabulating. Some of you know this better than I do, but I figured for those of us who, who are new to this, uh, if we take a look across New England, uh, Maine and New Hampshire, of course, as beneficiaries of the EPSCOR grant, and part, I expect, uh, have the greatest number of citizen science projects going on. Uh, but we see a number of them uh, all across New England. They, uh, they range from a mix of programs that involve active participation. There's about 27 of those. That is, you've got to go somewhere and do something, right? To those that, uh, in which citizen sciences serve as sensors, there's a little bit of a blurry line between these two. There are some where uh, you could set up uh, water quality monitoring in your area. You do have to go to the monitor and record the values and then report those, but the, the monitor is, the, the equipment's actually taking the data. Um, so kind of a hard call on with a citizen sensor active participation. Um, and the level of commitment ranges from a one-time only to seasonal to ongoing. And some of them will take data from anybody at any point in time. If you get hooked, great. And if you don't, that's okay. You gave us some data. Thank you very much. It's great. Um, and they have a simple web-based form, like I said, for submission of other citizen science projects. So I just grabbed, this is the, the spreadsheet that I put together, to just kind of give a, an overview of this. Uh, and I'll make sure and send this along to you, Frank, so you have a copy of the, the PowerPoint. Um, but we've got a number of these. You can see Christmas bird count, of course, has a long history of, of, of uh, here in, in the US and actually across the world, I think, at least in the UK as well. Uh, and then a number of others that are focused on particular taxa. You can see some that require active participation. Um, there's a couple in here uh, where if you fish to report uh, qualities of the fish that you catch. I counted those as citizen sensor projects because I figure if you fish, you're going to fish anyway. right? So taking those data is something that you do incidentally while you're out there. Um, so there's a number of different projects uh, that you can see here. And all kinds of different ways to get involved, and some of them do span across the entirety of New England. So, you know, it's good regional data that we can think about. I have a vested interest in, in proposing some citizen science projects. Uh, as the curator of the herbarium at UMM, uh, we're currently digitizing our collection. I know Orno's gone far along the way with that one. I'm not sure where other institutions in the area are in regard to digitizing natural history collections, but I'm keen to see some of that work uh, moved forward. So this is the process of taking, say, for example, pressed plant specimens that have labels that contain data of when they were collected. The specimen itself will tell you if that plant was in flower at that date in that place, whether it had fruit on it or not. And those data can be digitized or put into a database along with the images of the specimen and made available to folks online. So I'm keen on this because I come from FSU where my major professor essentially did that during the course of my graduate work. And so I'm keen to do that. And we're well on the way. We've got, I want to say, about 80% of our collection transcribed into a data sheet that's going to be moved into a database over the summer. Uh, and then we'll begin to work on the imaging those specimens. But natural history collections, uh, broadly speaking, um, have a place in providing information about the ecology of our areas and broad geographic ranges. Uh, and there's some really good organizations out there. The North American Network for Smaller Barrier, 
uh, and I dig bio. It's got to be the coolest little acronym. Uh, I dig bio is a, uh, two initiatives led by, uh, I guess for me, fortunately enough, my major professor and one of his good friends, uh, who are doing uh, initiatives to try and digitize as many biological collections as possible. Uh, and you can see so far, they've got 27,652,800 specimen records already digitized and in databases and connected through this I dig bio effort. Uh, so they provide support. Uh, this is an NSF-funded project, uh, and they're able to provide support for people who want to get some of these things up and, and running. The North American Network of Small Herbaria is a beneficiary of this project. Uh, and in fact, as a herbarium curator, we're currently listed there. As soon as our data sheet is in a database, I just one click upload it here with the North American Network of Small Herbaria, and it's available to everybody there. And these folks, incidentally, were really keen when they found out I was from Maine. They were like, oh, we don't have a database from Maine yet. It was like, we'll get it. We'll absolutely get that from it. So I want to make that argument that natural history collections could serve as that. Then, this is the last thing, I promise. <laughs> uh, but what I wanted to do is toss out a couple of questions to you. Again, being new to the area, being interested in this, and trying to think regionally, uh, what are some things that are worth considering uh, and, and some of these there may be answers to already, and I just don't know them, so I wanted to throw them out there, so forgive my ignorance if you would. Um, I have to wonder what data from different citizen science efforts would be useful in collaborations <coughs> toward conservation and preservation. Someone's collecting data on birds, someone's collecting data on plants, someone's collecting data on insects. Uh, all these organisms interact with one another. Do the data collected about those organisms have value for us in collaboration, trying to describe trends in our, our global, in our regional ecosystems. And I'd argue there, there must be, um, but I think that's worth thinking about. And then that leads to this question, which is how easily are those data made available uh, for that research? Uh, and how often are reports made of these data collectively? Is there an entity in place to coordinate this work? So if we've got a number of natural history organizations in New England that are interested in monitoring environmental quality, is there a body in the region that looks at the output data from these organizations and develops recommendations based on it? I assume to some degree, but I don't know with what regularity. So again, all questions here at this point. I just wanted to raise them. So there's a partial answer to that. There is an organization called Darren, Down East Education right. Research Network, yep. which is trying to do some of that. They've had four convergence symposia where they brought together land trust people yep. and science people, and that will now be housed at CERC. They're, they've become the uh, financially sponsoring organization. Right. And it's, I think, attempting to do what you're talking about. Right. So far, they've been collecting, they've having group presentations but I don't think there's been any organized data collection, and maybe somebody from CERC can say something about <laughs> where that's headed. Right, and I had to thank you for bringing that up, yeah, because I had noticed that as you had sent along information to me that there's quite a bit going on, and again, please forgive my ignorance, this is just being new to the area, but these are just considerations I thought would be worth thinking about if they're not already on the table. Um, somebody at CERC said that if Darren hadn't existed, CERC would have had to create it. So, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, that's a good thing. Yeah. So, um, I'm from CERN. Um, <laughs> Thank you. But, uh, uh, on the megadata side, like eBird and um, uh, climate climate uh, sensor information from across the country, NOAA, mm -hmm. um, we are engaged now, and I'll talk a little bit about this in my presentation, but we're taking uh, ground down information, uh, songbird movements, raptor movements, all that stuff, and we're, we're putting it together with this corporation called EMC. Okay. They're a, a huge uh, big data corporation. They have 63,000 employees, but they took on a, a project with, through Earthwatch and and the Scoot Institute, we, became, we all became partners, and um, finally we're putting this data together. The idea is to create tools for end users that can better uh, interpret, better use, better engage with with the data. Because as you said earlier, 
um, sometimes data goes into a black hole and we never see it. This is, this is to get the, the casual observer who's going out there looking at um, you know, wildflower uh, blooming times or leaf out, whatever. We're putting all of that together and creating these, uh, hoping to create these, these new visualization tools. Um, and we think that that will cycle around to, to you know, bolster engagement at, at all different levels. I'm so glad you it's in its you. infancy. Infancy. We just started that this past year. The Darren stuff is, is uh, uh, I, I don't work with that exclusively, so I'm not as uh, uh, conversant about that. Um, but I do know that we at CERC are, are taking on a lot of things. We're also the fiduciary res responsible for this new citizen science association that's, that's global, uh, which, which um, Frank experienced when he was at San Jose there. They were sponsors of this of that particular conference. So there's there's quite a lot going on, and I'll I'll touch a little bit on that in my Excellent. presentation. I'm so glad to hear that. Thank you very much. Um, any questions or anything? That's what I've got for you.